just a brief commercial before I get started. If you're interested in reading a full manuscript of this message, I've prepared some copies of it, and they're out there on that table just as you go through the door. And uh, if you're interested in reading that, uh, you can get a copy after, after we're done this morning. I really appreciate the two fellows that preceded me. I was a little concerned about myself. I'm kind of weary. I know many of you are, and I asked the Lord to kind of help me preach this morning. And after those two messages, I, I'm ready, I think. <laughs> so I appreciate uh, the two brothers that, that spoke. It helped me to get ready. Last night I looked over my message and I decided to cut out everything that the other brethren have already touched on in my message. So in conclusion, <laughs> I, I heard about a little boy who went to Sunday school class and after he was done his mom and dad asked him, what did you learn in Sunday school class? And he said, we learned about marriage. And his dad said, well, what did you learn about marriage? And the little boy said, well, we learned that one man ought to be with one woman for life, and that's called monotony. <laughs> well, I, I hope that what I have to say is not monotonous, even though you may have heard some of these things touched upon by other speakers. Someone said that preaching is truth through personality, so I hope that if these things that you've already heard, if they're coming through my personality, maybe they'll be fresh and stick in your minds. My text is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the 18th verse, and the subject that we're going to be considering together is changed by beholding the glory. Let me just begin by reading this verse, and then we're going to take in what's around it in just a moment. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. I know that there are several of you who preached who wanted this topic, and I'm honored to have been chosen to speak on this topic, because we're going to talk about what the glory of the Lord means to us personally. What does the glory of the Lord mean to us? You know, there's too much, there's too much preaching and teaching, there's too much Bible study in the church that is merely academic. And... I know there are probably folks that think that, that, that we're all here at the renewal, we're all kind of a bunch of Bible geeks, but we're not. We're not here to just talk about things. We're not here to come up with some new truth. Uh, we're not here to just disseminate information. We're actually, we're here. The reason we talk about these things is because we want to clarify them so that you can appropriate them. It doesn't make any sense to talk about anything from the Bible unless it's, unless it's something that we can by faith appropriate and participate in and experience. It's, you know, fellowship with the Lord and talking about the Lord is not the same thing. Amen. And we need, we need to remember, I know all, all of you know this, but we need to remember this. It, well, th this sermon has taken on a little bit different form as, as I've heard the other messages I really want to use this sermon, uh, not just, I'm, I'm going to give you some things to think about and hopefully inform you, maybe say some things that, in a way that you haven't heard before, but more than anything, after everything we've already heard, and we've heard a lot of stuff, and you always do when you come to a renewal, but I want to exhort you in this message to draw near to God. It doesn't really matter if we know about the glory of God, if we don't draw near to Him, if we don't participate in His glory, if we're not affected by His glory, then it's all for naught, and we've wasted the last couple of days together. So we're not, we're not here to just talk about something. Uh, by the way, whenever you talk about God, He's always listening. Uh, God, is, God is not an object. God is not an issue. God is not a principle. God is a person. 
And you may be able to talk about other people behind their backs, but you can't talk about God behind his back. So, so we're, we, we don't want to just sort of objectify God and make him into a thing to be discussed. I'm not saying that we're doing this. I'm just exhorting us. Because that is a danger because we're still in the flesh. We're still in the flesh. And these renewals can, can be a great opportunity. They can also be kind of dangerous because you can come to a renewal and you can hear all these great Bible passages and great ideas uh, thrown around, and you can kind of, but you can kind of just take this and leave just pretty much as you came. But, but our objective is that, that when we behold the glory of the Lord, that we're affected by it, and that we're changed by it, and that we actually experience something. Okay, I'll get down off my soapbox now and preach this message. We should always consider a, a passage of Scripture in relation to its context. As someone has said, a text without a context is just a pretext. So I've read the passage from, for you from which this message is taken, verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 3. But I want you to see what Paul is doing in the verses around it. What is Paul saying here in this section? Well, he's making a comparison. He's making a comparison between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. His point overall, is that the new covenant has a greater glory. Amen. That's the point of, of this context here that I'm, that I'm using for this message. The new covenant is superior. It's superior in many ways. For example, Paul says, the old covenant was written on tablets of stone. The new covenant is written on the tablets of the human heart. He says that in chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. By the way, that sounds a lot like Jeremiah, doesn't it? Jeremiah 31, I'll write my law in their hearts and put it in their minds. Here's an important distinction between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant was sort of imposed from the outside. This do and live. The New Covenant works from the inside out. It's not imposed on us. It's, it, it's an inner transformation that then brings about a new kind of a new kind of life. That's an important thing to see. Paul also says another difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant here that he mentions. The Old Covenant is of the letter, which kills. The New Covenant is of the Spirit, which... But, but there, there's a veil. See? And Paul says the veil is only removed, how? In Christ. In Christ, the revelation is completed. And the greater glory is seen. Only in Christ is the veil removed. Uh, another, uh, just a footnote here. Remember that when Moses went up on the mountain, only Moses went up on the mountain. In a sense, you might say that only Moses saw the true glory of that old covenant. Nobody else was privy to that, that experience. You know, some of the elders, remember, they saw God's feet. But, but only Moses was there with the Lord for that time. So on, only he experienced that. Now in contrast, in contrast to that in the new covenant, everybody's privy to this glory. In the new covenant, everybody can be in the presence of the Lord. In the new covenant, everybody can see the glory. It's not just for some spiritually elite person. Everyone. There's no veil over our faces. No veil. We, and, and in Christ, we see more of the glory of God Amen. than even Moses himself was able to see. By the way, Moses saw that glory only once. Only once. But we have the liberty, Paul says in verse 17, to gaze continually at the glory. You can look intently from day to day, and the glory doesn't fade. It just gets brighter as we continue to look intently at the face of the Lord. Now, notice this little detail. In our text, Paul says that we see this glory as it is reflected in a mirror. Now, there's an important qualification here that has been touched on before, but I'll, I'll touch on it again. This, uh, this parallels what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, just as I also have been fully no. Now, in the ancient world in which Paul lived, a mirror was not the highly polished surface that you and I look into. Uh, in the ancient world, looking into a mirror was 
sort of on the level of looking into a piece of aluminum foil. Okay, there was, there was a reflection, there was an image that could be seen, but it, it wasn't a perfect reflection. That's what he's talking about. So, so understand that even in the new covenant, we see more than in the old, but it's not a perfect view. It's not a perfect, it's in a glass dimly, or the, the image is still obscured by the flesh. The image is still obscured by the world. Now, when this world comes down, then we'll see, Paul says, face to face. Face to face I shall behold him, as we have shared that song together earlier. So the new covenant, even though it's a greater glory, is still not a perfect reflection. There's still more to see, but... There's an awful lot that we can see even now. And what this text is saying and what I want to exhort all of you to do is to begin now to gaze at the glory that you can see. No, we can't see perfectly. But there's a lot that can be seen. And you've got to start looking now. Or I like the word, I'm going to be using the word gaze. I like the word, not just look, because when we... When we say, in English, when we say look, you know, we, we kind of mean like a casual glance, you know. Oh, yeah, I saw that. No, we're talking about gazing at the Lord. Remember when you were first married and you would gaze at one another, you know. It's, I'm talking about that intense gaze that doesn't, it's not you just look and then look away. No, it's an intense gaze. We've got to start gazing at the glory of the Lord that we can see now. Because something amazing happens to us. When we do, and we'll, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about that in just a moment. So we have to begin now to gaze at the glory of the Lord. And if we gaze steadily at it, it has an amazing effect upon us. As we gaze steadily at the glory of God in Christ, we will begin to be transformed by that vision. We will be changed into the image of the one at whom we gaze. The more we gaze and the longer we gaze, the more we'll be transformed. It's from glory to glory. There's a progression. It increases. It doesn't fade. It is impossible to gaze at the glory of the Lord and not be transformed. It is impossible to be in the presence of God and not be changed by what you see. So, you know, if we have churches filled with people who basically haven't been changed, it's simply because they haven't seen the glory. And it's our job to help them to see it. Amen. That's our job. One day our faith will become sight. By the way, it's your faith. You, we gaze by faith. Okay, we're, we don't necessarily have a, a, vis, a physical manifestation of the Lord like Moses did. We gaze by faith. Your faith is the means of your transformation. We walk by faith, not by sight. But of course, one day our, fa our faith will become sight, and the transformation at that time will be completed. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. So there's a marvelous process that must begin in your life now. If you begin to gaze at the glory of the Lord now, this process of transformation begins, and it will be completed when you see the Lord as he is. But folks, it's got, that process has got to begin now. It's got to begin here, now, in this world, in the body. When you're still in the flesh, you've got to begin to gaze by faith at the glory of God. And then it will be finished. It will be finished when He comes again. Now this transformation that I'm going to speak about this morning is at the very heart of the gospel. In fact, you could say that the very essence, the very essence of Christianity, of Christian faith, is being, is that of being transformed into the image of, of Christ. Christianity is no more and no less than that. It's being transformed into the image of God's Son. And that transformation is, of course, a process. It doesn't, it doesn't just happen all at once. It's a process, a gradual change that we go through. That we go through. And individuals, by the way, may, may be at different stages in this transformation. Some of you have been gazing for a long time. And you're a little farther along. Some of you have not been gazing very long. And you still have a way to go. It's a journey. This is a journey. It's not, it's not a mechanical thing. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen apart from your knowledge of it. It's not something that God just sort of does to you without your involvement. 
it's a process in which you are very much involved. And by the way, just, just a, an application of that. We, we need to be patient with one another. Because we're not all at the same stage. And we've got, all of us have areas that, are, that still need to be transformed. And we, we need to be patient and, and kind one to another as this process continues. Most of you have already begun this process of transformation. You've already begun to gaze at the Lord. But it's good for us to remember where we came from. Remember who you once were without the Lord and the glory of His grace. We should always glory in the grace of God. No matter what stage in this process you may be at, no matter how many years you may have been gazing at the Lord, no matter how much progress you may have made toward the image of Christ, don't forget the, the rock from which you were hewn. Amen. And always glory in the grace of God. One of the dangers that most of us face those of us who have begun this process of transformation, is the danger of pride. We become prideful of the progress that we have made. Let me just remind you, you have not arrived. You have not arrived. No matter how many years you've been in the Lord, no matter how much progress you've made, watch out. Watch out that pride does not begin to grip your life. You have not arrived. There's still, Paul said, I, I'm straining continually towards that which is ahead, forgetting the things that are, that are behind. So this process must continue. We are continually being transformed. So we must continually gaze at the glory of the Lord. Do not become too satisfied with your progress and stop gazing at the Lord. Amen. It is so, there are a million distractions. We live in an age of distractions. We can begin to gaze at other things, not necessarily evil, sinful things, but lesser things, less than the Lord himself. For, let me give you a couple of examples. You may begin to gaze, instead of gazing at the Lord, you may be, you may be completely wrapped up in a ministry. You may become so wrapped up in serving the Lord that you're not gazing at him anymore. That's a real danger. That's something I've had, to, I've had to deal with that. I've been convicted about that myself. So those of us who are, especially those of us who are paid to, you know, we're professional holy men, you know. And I, I speak sarcastically, of course. But, but that's a special temptation for us because it's our job. So we begin to, we, preachers, we begin to read the Bible just to get our sermons. Whoa, oh, that's dangerous. And I, I, we're all in some degree, guilty of that. We become distracted by ministry. Or here's another example. We may even become distracted by gazing at one another. The church can become ingrown, and we're only living to please each other. Let me just remind you, God is not interested in transforming anybody into your image. Now, I know the world would be a lot better if everybody was more like you, but... But that's not God's purpose. Amen. So we're not to gaze at one another. We're not to please one another. We're being transformed into His image. Amen. And our gaze is, that doesn't mean we ignore one another and become hermits on the mountainside. We're still in fellowship with one another. But, but we don't simply gaze at one another. We are to encourage one another to gaze at the Lord. And we do that together, corporately as a fellowship. Now I'm going to... I'm going to make three uh, simple points in this message. I'm going to tell you that you need to be transformed. Secondly, I'm going to tell you that this transformation is possible. And thirdly, I'm going to tell you the means by which we're transformed. Okay, those three simple things. First of all, you need, we need a transformation. Amen. This is not an option. This is not something for the spiritually elite or a chosen class of God's people, or some priestly caste that's up above everyone else, every single person in Christ is being transformed. And the reason why that's the case is because we all need it. Amen. We need a change. We need to make a change. We need a transformation because of the terrible consequences of sin and our sinful nature. Sin really has ruined and wrecked the human race. And let me say it even more personally than that. Sin has ruined you. Sin has wrecked you and me. 
It's a very personal thing. Sin has marred. Remember, we were made in the image of God. Sin has marred that image of God in us. We were made to reflect the image of God, His glory, to some degree. That's what being made in the image of God means, is we, we in some degree, we reflect. We were made to reflect God's image, but, but sin has marred that reflection. We, we might say sometimes even be almost beyond recognition. Almost beyond recognition. God said to Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house, and I'll give you a message. And Jeremiah went down to the potter's house, and he saw the potter working at the wheel, and the clay was marred in his hands. Oh, Father, what, God, what will you do with the clay? Will you throw it away? Are you going to throw us away? We're marred. We're not what you made us to be. We're not what you intended us to be. God, what are you, Potter, what are you going to do with the clay that's marred in your hands? And the potter says, I'm going to make it again. I'm going to make you over. I'm not gonna th- God has not given up on the human race. He didn't throw us away. He began to ma- he's, he's going to make us again. He's going to put you back on his spinning wheel. He's going to form you again. He's remaking us. I feel that those of us who have been in the church for a while, many of us like myself have grown up in the church, we begin to forget how marred our vessels really are. Remember Jesus had to say to a religious man, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. Those of us who come from a religious heritage and tradition may begin to underestimate the effect of sin on our lives. Sin is so horrible precisely because we are made in the image of God. There's nothing worse than taking the image of God and marring it or misrepresenting it. And that's what sin does to all of us. Paul said, nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. Sin has ruined our capacity to properly reflect the glory and image of God. The only hope that we have is to be put back on the spinning wheel and for the potter to take us in his hands and to begin to reshape us. That's the only hope that we have. When God created man, God created man for himself. We were made for God. We were made for his purposes, for his use. Not only has the image of God in us been marred, we have also prostituted that image. This this whole thing about prostitution is something that comes up again and again in the Old Testament prophets. Israel was called a, a, a prostitute. They had prostituted themselves. We have all prostituted ourselves and our God given capacities. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See? We prostituted ourselves by taking what belongs to God and what should be used to reflect and glorify God, and we use it for other things. That's what I mean by prostitution. God made us to reflect His glory, and we have that incredible capacity, but instead we look, and when I say we do this, I mean in, in Adam we, do, we did this, okay? Instead we look to the lesser glory of idols that we make, and we prostitute ourselves with them. One of the prophets said, They worshipped worthless idols and became worthless themselves. Because we have that capacity to reflect the image of God, we also have the capacity to reflect the image of whatever or whomever we are gazing at to worship. A man who looks at material wealth will grow more and more greedy. A person who looks to lust will grow more and more lustful. And so gradually, we become shaped by the things that we love. That's just the way we were made. Now, originally, we were made for God, so we were to f- reflect Him, but we, we, when we go to other things, when we go to idols, and we prostitute ourselves and sin in that way, we become shaped by those, those gods that we make. Just read the first chapter of Romans. And Paul says there, uh, he talks there about the tragic consequences of spiritual prostitution. They exchanged the glory of God for other things. And when that happens, you know what happens? When we exchange the glory of God for something else, a bottomless pit of depravity is opened. And we may have fallen, our culture may have fallen into that pit. But Paul said the gospel is the glory, is the power of God unto salvation. There's, there's a recovery. 
Have you ever noticed, those, especially those of you who preach and teach and those of you who try to witness to unbelievers, have you ever noticed it's getting harder and harder to convince people that they're really in need? It's sort of a sign of our times. It's, it's becoming harder and harder to convince people that they need anything, that they're, really, that they're really in need, because we have so much in this affluent culture. We don't really think we're in need. We're comfortable. Most people think that what they need is perhaps a few new habits or perhaps a little more discipline, but not a transformation. I mean, I don't really need a transformation, I'm pretty good, aren't I? I'm not as bad as that guy over there. So maybe I just need to add a few spiritual disciplines. Maybe I just need to add a little church to my life. Let me tell you, you need a lot more than a little church in your life. You need a transformation. The gospel is not a program of self-help or self-improvement. The gospel is about transformation. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. By the way, in that, in that text, the word conform, the world is trying to conform us, and that word literally means to be pressed into a mold. It, it, it's funny, isn't it, that the world, they claim to be so tolerant I mean, let me let you in on a little secret. They're not tolerant. The world is not tolerant. They're trying to press you into their mold. They want you to think like them, and they're, and they're not tolerant of you when you don't. So don't be, don't be conformed. Don't be pressed into the world's mold. Be transformed, as Brother Boyce said, transformed like a caterpillar into a butterfly. We're being made new creatures. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. But, but how will this transformation be accomplished? That's the question. How will this tran We need a change. We need to be transformed. But how is that going to work? How is that going to be accomplished? You know, the, the worldly wise men out there are always optimistic about the progress of the human race. And that's humanism. That is not Christianity. Christianity teaches a transformation for individuals who believe in Jesus Christ. I, I admire many of our brothers and sisters who, who stand up for social issues. We are to be salt and light. I admire uh, Christians who, who speak their minds about the issues of the day. But God's purpose is to save individuals who trust in Jesus. And he's transforming those people in Christ into his image. God is, not, God is not interested necessarily in just saving society per se. And that's not to be the primary work of the church. We are to be salt and light. We are that. But our primary work is to transform individuals, is to point people to Christ so that he can transform them into his image. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. God wants to do more with us than just make us respectable people. And how often we confuse respectability with holiness. Let me move to my second point. A transformation is possible. Now that's the gospel. That's the good news. It's not particularly good news to know that you need a transformation. That can be rather depressing until you know that the transformation is possible. That's the good news of the gospel. The gospel proclaims and promises us that it is possible for us to change and be transformed. Can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Can the leopard change his spots? See, under the Old Covenant, the answer was, to that was no. But now we have a greater glory, and with man this is impossible, but with God all things shall be possible. We have all, have you not witnessed the miraculous transformation that the gospel of Christ has worked in the lives of people? Yes. Have you not witnessed that? We have, we have all seen you know, drunks made sober. Uh, people with all kinds of addictions freed from the, that bondage. Wounded people healed. Greedy people made generous. Inarticulate people turned into powerful witnesses. All of this comes from the power of the gospel. The gospel, by the way, does not give us steps to a new you. Amen. The gospel is the power of God. Amen. 
Nothing else is needed. That's why, as we have said already, the gospel has to be proclaimed. When the gospel is not proclaimed clearly, or when it is obscured from the minds of people, transformation becomes impossible, and people are reduced to trying to improve themselves. And there's a lot of Christianity, by the way, that's like that, sort of a self-help kind of approach to the faith, and it's wrong. Now, to some degree, you can change your life to some degree. There have been people who, without becoming Christians, have, for example, joined an AA group and have gotten off alcoholism. That's possible. You know, if you can probably discipline yourself to get up a little earlier in the morning or something like that, change your diet, lose a little weight, something like that. But being transformed into the image of Christ, that's a completely different matter. That's a completely different issue. We're, we're not just talking here about getting up a little earlier or... Or something like, or, you know, stopping some... Ha- you don't need Jesus to do any of those things. You don't need the glory of God for any of those things. You can handle those things on your own, and people have done that. But to become transformed into the image of Christ, that's an entirely different issue. Amen. You're going to need some help for that. You know, I don't know, how, I don't know how millions of people out there sit and listen to sermons about being with, like Jesus. We hear these... You know, preachers preach, we, we ought to be like Jesus. We ought to be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? But there are millions of people who have never embraced the gospel. And it's pointless to talk about being like Jesus until you embrace the power of the gospel. Amen. Otherwise, you're going to be very, very frustrated. Millions of people want all the benefits of the Christian life without ever embracing the gospel. And it just won't happen. Now, one of Satan's biggest projects is to obscure the gospel. He's been doing that since the beginning. He's good at it. He's been very successful with that. He likes to cover up what God unveils. He likes to obscure the truth of God. He did that at the very beginning with the first man and the first woman. In this context here in 2 Corinthians, if you look over in the fourth chapter, Paul says, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Satan has managed to pull a veil of confusion and distraction over the eyes of millions of people, not only in our generation, but in every generation past. This has been happening from the very beginning. Paul wrote it was happening in Paul's day. Uh, sometimes Sometimes we might be tempted to think that things are worse now than they've ever been. That's not necessarily the case. Satan has always been active. Do you think that everywhere Paul went that everybody believed the gospel? Read the book of Acts. Paul got chased and stoned for preaching the gospel. So that Satan has always been active. He's still blinding the eyes of the unbelieving. People in this world will continue to stumble around in the darkness until they see the light of the glory of Christ. Amen. So it's our job to preach Christ. That's our job. That's what Paul said he was doing. He said, I pre- I'm going to preach Christ. We should not be harsh or or uh, uncaring about people who have their eyes blinded. It's our job to preach Christ to them. We should have compassion on them. They're like sheep without a shepherd. We should preach Christ so that they can come to the one who can open their eyes. Also in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, Paul said this, We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord and ourselves as bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In other words, to be transformed, we have to see Christ clearly. And Christ is the catalyst for this personal transformation that that I'm talking about. Think about it for a moment. Jesus always transformed the lives of people that he encountered. Read the Gospels and see if this is not... If this is not the truth, I'll make you fishers of men. Amen. Remember Paul on the road to Damascus, and we could multiply the examples. Jesus, when Jesus is seen clearly, he always has a transforming effect. He always does. There is no self-help program that can replace a personal encounter and continual fellowship with Christ. God's way of transforming us is to put us in Christ. And in fact, he has stated categorically that it is his set, predetermined purpose that everyone who's in Christ is going to end up like Christ. Romans 8, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined 
to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, and whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. There's our word. In that passage, the word glorify, glorification, is just another word for what will happen to us when this process of transformation is fully completed. Even our mortal bodies will be transformed to be like his glorious body, Philippians chapter 3 says. And this is so certain to happen that Paul can write about it in Romans as if it has already happened. One of the brethren spoke about this. It's in past tense. You've been glorified. It's like God is saying this is so certain to happen, I can write about it through my servant Paul as if it's already happened. If you're in Christ, you're going to end up like Christ. Now, your job is to remain, abide in Christ. That's, that's your job. You might say that Christ is the spiritual environment in which God does his work of transformation. He is the true vine. We are the branches. Without him, we can do nothing. Nothing. So the most vital issue is this. Are you in Christ? The most vital issue is are you in fellowship with Christ on a daily basis? Now... If you are in fellowship with him, if you're in him and you're in fellowship with him, if you're abiding in Christ, this process of transformation has already begun. And I believe there are, there are a couple of specific areas that the Lord will begin to transform in your life. Your affection and your ability. Your affections and your ability. I mean, let me talk about these two things for just a moment. The Lord will begin to transform your affection. Your affection is what you love or what you have a preference for. Now, there's a part of us that is naturally drawn and has affection for the things of the world. These things of the world, by the way, in 1 John 2 are called the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But when you begin to look at the glory of Christ, those worldly lusts begin to fade in your heart. And by the way, the only way those lusts are going to fade is by having a new affection. It's not just a matter of just sort of turning off the flesh... It's a matter of getting a new affection for something else. And when you get that new affection for the Lord and you're gazing at Him, those other things sort of lose their luster and attraction for you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. So we set our affection on things above where Christ is seated to the right hand of God. Secondly, our ability is transformed. If you're gazing at the Lord, God will enable you to do things that you couldn't do on your own. He will equip you. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever felt this way. I, I suppose all of us, I feel this way regularly. Inadequate. I mean, if you don't feel that way, there's something wrong with you. you, you you've got some pride or some delusions of, of grandeur or something. But if you're engaged in the work of the Lord for very long, you're, you're going to have a feeling of inadequacy. Let me just give you an example. I've, I've thought about this just recently. You know, sometimes when we're in the, in the life of the church, sometimes things kind of seem to stagnate, you know, and, and people start asking, you know, what can we do to sort of get things going again? And this thought crossed my mind. Jesus told us to go and make disciples. Now, we quote that so much, I think it's lost its, how high of a calling that is. Make disciples. Disciples. Now, at our house, we have three cats. I can't make my cats do what I want them to do. How am I going to make disciples? Have you ever thought about that? How do you make a disciple? Now, I suppose somebody's going to write 12 easy steps to making disciples. You know, those books are out there, and they've been written, and they're going to continue to be written. But there's no formula. What a high calling. Make disciples. Go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples. That's hard. That's, how are you going to do that? We don't have the ability to do that. But the Lord will equip us to do what we cannot do on our own. His power is made perfect in weakness, in your weakness. As long as you keep looking at yourself, by the way, you're always going to be discouraged. If your entire focus, if your entire focus is about you, you're always going to be discouraged. We're to, le we're to look at the Lord, and He will equip us. You will still be an earthen vessel, but He will put a treasure 
in your earthen vessel. Christianity is primarily, fundamentally about fellowship with Christ. Being a Christian is more than just being good or trying to keep the law. Christianity is not just a religion. It angers me when people sort of lump Christianity in with all the other religions in the world. Christianity is not primarily a religion. It is a daily relationship with the living Christ who is transforming us into his image. The transformation is his job. Our job is to stay close to him and to keep gazing at his glory. In other words, this transformation that I'm talking about cannot come simply through a disciplined Christian life. Recently it's become very popular to talk about spiritual disciplines like prayer and fasting and solitude and Bible study and memorization. But these spiritual disciplines in and of themselves do not bring about a transformation in a person. Not the kind of transformation that God desires. Only the presence of the indwelling Christ can bring this transformation. Now, of course, if you're gazing at the Lord, you're going to be a disciplined person. You're, you're going to want to pray. You're gonna, that's part of gazing at him. You're going to want to read his word. Those things are going to be uh, become a, a natural expression of your relationship with the Lord. In fact, they, they, they probably won't even be disciplined anymore. They'll just sort of be a joy and a natural thing that you will, that you will do. It's sad that many Christians and many Christian leaders take basically an Old Testament approach to Christianity. Right. Amen. You see, remember the Old Testament was imposed from the outside. But Christianity always comes from an inner transformation. We should not strive to make unconverted church members act like Christians. That's a waste of time. Amen. It's a waste of time. Now let me just add this, this caveat. I'm not advocating a lack of discipline. Okay? I'm not giving anybody an excuse to be lazy or, or not to pray or not to read and study. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not simply telling you to let go and let God or any kind of fluff like that. We are to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. But what I'm saying is that our efforts to perfect holiness will ultimately only need to legalism unless we are in fellowship with our blessed Lord. Without the presence of the living Christ, discipline becomes dead ritual. It'll be kind of like trying to start a car without the gasoline or without the spark plug. There will be no power. The power comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. God wants us to be like Christ, but he hasn't just sort of said, now, you try to be like Christ. Hope you make it. He's put a part of himself in us. We have a member of the Godhead dwelling within us, the Holy Spirit. He's the gas in our tank. He's the spark plug that ignites spiritual life. Without the Spirit, we don't even belong to Jesus. The Spirit quickens us or gives life to our mortal bodies even now so that we can do the will of God. That's why we're told to walk in the Spirit and be filled with the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't grieve the Spirit because His whole objective is to make you like Jesus. And Paul says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Spirit empowers us. That's why there's liberty setting us free to serve and please the Lord. Because of His presence in our lives, we are no longer debtors to the flesh. Jesus said, I'll send you another helper. And you need a helper. We need that. And so the Spirit produces the fruit of Christ's likeness, Christ-like character in our lives. You know, the Holy Spirit wants the same thing for you that God wants. They're working toward the same goal, to make you like Jesus. God wants you to be like Jesus. The Holy Spirit dwelling in you wants you to be like Jesus. The Spirit doesn't have his own agenda over here somewhere. And I'm afraid that a lot of things that are attributed to the Holy Spirit in the church today have very little to do with being like Christ. That's his ministry to us. He, he shines the glory of Christ to us so that we will be more and more like him. The Spirit is guiding us toward Christ's likeness. Let me move to my final, my final point. This transformation. How does this transformation come? What is the means that God uses? This transformation comes through looking at Christ. Looking or gazing, the word that I've used, at Christ. If we continually look, if we steadily gaze at, the, at Christ himself, we will be transformed into that same image. Amen. We do not become more and more like Christ through discipline alone, but through insight into his holy person. We are to gaze at Christ himself. 
Christianity is nothing less than seeing Christ clearly and being transformed by that vision. So you must continue, continually gaze at him. Continue to gaze at him. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We know there are a thousand things, however, to distract us from him. We know that's true. So how do we gaze at Christ? First of all, it's by faith, as I've already said. We have to begin with faith. Remember, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, Though you have not seen him with these eyes, you love him. And though you do not see him now with these eyes, you believe in him, and you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. There's our word again. The stronger your faith is, the more clearly you will see Christ. The weaker, and faith can be strong or weak. You know, it's not a, we were discussing this at the table eating earlier. Faith is not just something that you get once and then you've got it. It's not like getting a shot, you know, in the arm and then it's sort of in there all the time. Faith can be strong or weak. Okay, and when your faith is strong, your vision's clear. When your faith is weak, your vision's clouded. It's just that simple. Unbelief obscures Christ from our view. Faith makes him clearer. Remember in the days of his flesh, there were people who believed in Christ and they were able to see who he really was. There were those who did not believe and so they couldn't see who he really was. Unbelief is a kind of spiritual blindness. Remember the time Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And they sort of bannered back and forth, some say Elijah. Then Peter pipes up all of a sudden and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He probably went, where did that come from? Because Jesus then said, this wasn't given, to, this didn't come from you, Peter. It was a revelation given to you by my father. If you see Christ clearly, you didn't come to that on your own. God gave you that vision because of your faith. Amen. And that, that, that vision, by the way, can go away because remember right after that, Peter said, That's, you're not going to go to the cross. So don't, don't count on that all the time. God will reveal Christ to us. It will come as a gift because of our faith. So how do we continue to gaze at Christ? Let me become very practical. We're almost done. Now, I'm, in these points that I'm going to give you, I'm not giving you a formula. Because if you don't have faith, these things will not necessarily help you. Okay? If your faith is weak, these things that I'm going to talk about will not necessarily help you. But, but in a very practical way, how do we gaze at the Lord? How do we do that? First of all, we have to begin to see Christ on every page of the Bible. I think it was Brother Fred Blakely that said uh, one time that Christ is wrapped in the swaddling clothes of the Old and the New Testament. We have to read the Bible to see the Lord. It's easy for people to read the Bible and miss Jesus. And today, so many people are reading the Bible like some kind of self-help book. But we come to the Scriptures to see Christ. God said, this is my beloved Son. Hear Him. And here's a good exercise. I'm just getting very practical here. Here's a good exercise as a follow-up to this message. Read the Gospels and just look at what Jesus did and what He said and meditate on what Jesus is like. Look at him touching a leper with compassion. See him fearlessly declaring the word of God. Watch him cleanse the temple in righteous anger. Hear him praying in Gethsemane. And remember, you're being transformed into that image. That image. Christ is being formed in us. His character is being expressed through our lives. And by the way, if that's the truth... You should remember that the world's not going to like you any more than it liked Jesus. Christianity is Christ dwelling in us and his, his character being expressed in your life, in your character. Christ in you is the hope of glory. So you see, Christianity is not just about being good or keeping some rules. It's about Christ in me. The life of Christ lived through me and through you. Secondly, we should cultivate an awareness of Christ's presence through prayer. We should, as Paul said, pray without ceasing. Like an unending conversation with the Lord. This is something I want to do better at. I'll be honest with you. Most people only pray when they're in trouble or when they need something. Many of the great men of God in the history of the church were great men of prayer. We spent hours and hours in prayer. Men like the Puritan John Owen or Jonathan Edwards or John Wesley or David Brainerd. All of those men 
prayed and prayed and prayed, were in fellowship with God, and they wrote about their experiences with God. And you don't hear much about that anymore in the church. Finally, we do not gaze at the Lord only privately, but also in fellowship with one another. This is a corporate activity. We should never make the Christian faith just a personal, private affair, because it's not. It's not just you and Jesus. It's us and Jesus. Notice that our text began with the plural, we all. Verse 18, but we all with unveiled face, etc. This is something we do together. The church fellowship is to always be gazing at the glory of the Lord. We're to encourage one another to do this. Our services should be entirely focused on the Lord. Do not neglect the assembly of yourselves together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and as, as long as it is called today. Our fellowship with one another only makes sense in this context. Our fellowship with one another is only, it's not just getting together and eating. Our fellowship together is when we gaze together at the Lord. Then, it's only be, then that's when it's worthy of being called fellowship. So this transformation will take place in all of us together as we worship the Lord and gaze at the beauty of His holiness. Here's how I will conclude. Is there anything in your life that is obscuring your vision of Christ? If it is, get it out of the way. Have you been distracted by something else or by someone else? I'm not saying that you should forget your responsibilities. But is there anything else less, that is less than Christ that has distracted you? Identify those things. Be specific. What is it? Do something about it. So may we always gaze at the face of the Lord and be lost in wonder, love, and praise until that day when we stand fully in His presence and see Him face to face. May we never lose our childlike wonder in the presence of Christ. I want to conclude uh, with a prayer that, uh, that is from, it's attributed to St. Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland. You may have heard of the breastplate of St. Patrick, that prayer. I'm not, we're not sure if he wrote that himself or not, but it's attributed to him. And I want to conclude with this prayer from the breastplate of St. Patrick. I want you all to bow with me, and we'll make this our prayer and the end of this message. Here is our prayer. Christ with me. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Christ in me. Christ below me. Christ above me. Christ at my right. Christ at my left. Christ in breadth. Christ in length, Christ in height, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Our Father, that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.